Let me begin by thanking Mr. Mark Donfred, the Director General and founder of the ICD, for honoring me with an invitation to this historic conference to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and to reflect on the idea of a world without wars and our opportunities for peace building in a time of global insecurity. It is a pleasure for me to address you today, and as I do so, I am fully aware that law, international or domestic, is but one element in effective peace building. Political forces, economics, and of course, effective diplomacy, all play an important and complementary role in building and fostering peace. The relevant significance of each of these may, of course, vary depending on the context. This morning, I wish to address you on some of the ways in which international law has contributed to peace building, sometimes through the building of a wall and at other times through the breaking down of one. I am particularly intrigued by the analogy um, given to us by the lady from South Africa of a bonfire into which these different people were sitting and wondering whether to throw in their log or not. And as I speak this morning, or this, this afternoon, I am hoping that whatever I say will, be, will, will amount to um, a contrib positive contribution of my log into the bonfire, and that certainly I will not take out a log from the bonfire. Um, as an introductory remark, um, I just wish to, to um, tell you that the court uh, for which I work, the International Court of Justice, is often confused with the International Criminal Court, just because they're both in The Hague. The roles of the two are very different. Uh, the International Criminal Court uh, tries individuals for crimes against humanity and war crimes and genocide. That is not the court. Um, from where I, I, I come. I come from the International Court of Justice, which is the judicial arm of the United Nations and which um, resolves disputes between states and offers advisory opinions to the United Nations. So, so that is the perspective from which I'm going to address you this morning. And I will, st uh, the, the topic um, for me uh, the, today is, is um, I, I wish to highlight uh, that, that walls or barriers may be physical and visible, such as, the, as in the case of Berlin, the Berlin Wall, or they may be invisible, such as those that divide people along racial, religious, ethnic, gender, or other lines. Invisible walls or barriers can be just as effective in dividing people as physical barriers. In international law, for example, what we know as frontiers or boundaries between states, whether on land or at sea, are in effect invisible or imaginary lines along agreed coordinates that divide those states. For that matter, there have been many occasions where the final identification of a clear and equitably determined boundary between people can bring an end to years and sometimes decades of conflict. Secondly, wars are not always negative. They can be peacemakers or peace breakers, depending on the context and the circumstances. Either way, wars always have legal, political, and diplomatic consequences. For the purposes of my presentation, I will refer to a few examples where wars of bar or barriers have had particular consequences in international law and where the International Court of Justice has in its role as the judicial organ of the UN contributed to peace building through the building or the tearing down of a wall. I will start um, with wars as peace breakers. <laughs> 
I will start with the example of where the court has contributed to the dismantling of walls in an effort to promote peace and justice. While there are many examples, I will cite only two of those examples that I consider stand, uh, most outstanding. The first is the case of the racial barriers in Namibia. We've heard this morning a little bit about the apartheid wall in South Africa. Well, this was an extension that went right into Southwest Africa. Perhaps the most obvious and certainly one of the most egregious types of walls or barriers between people is that which exists where a state enshrines in its laws and implements in its policies segregation on the basis of race or skin color. Although not physical, the wall of apartheid is every bit as effective in separating the races as any concrete wall. The 20th century history of Namibia is well known. Namibia was a German colony occupied by South Africa during World War I. And South Africa was to administer that territory under the mandated system uh, of the League of Nations at the time. However, there came a time uh, when that mandate was terminated. Now, while South Africa um, had the mandate over the people of Southwest Africa, as they were then known, the government of South Africa constructed this invisible wall between the different races in the form of a rigid policy of racial separation called apartheid. Despite the moves to decolonize across much of Africa in the 1960s, South Africa refused to withdraw from South Africa. Sorry, South Africa from Namibia. On 4 December 1960, two members of the United Nations, Liberia and Ethiopia, lodged an application with the World Court, the International Court of Justice, seeking a declaration that South Africa was, by implementing its apartheid policy in a mandated territory, acting in contravention of the League of Nations mandate for Southwest Africa. However, the court, in a judgment that has been criticized um, throughout history, decided that the applicants could, did not have standing in the matter and didn't even look at the merits of the claim. So the, the, the case was dismissed and the apartheid system continued unabated for two more decades in Southwest Africa. So th this was the first attempt to bring down that wall by two countries. Of course, remember, the people of Southwest Africa did not exist as a nation. And so how on earth could they approach the court for their, in their own right is, is to anyone's imagination. Because only they would have a standing. Now, three months after the judgment, the United Nations General Assembly took matters into its own hands, declaring that South Africa's mandate over Namibia was terminated. However, South Africa would not budge. And as international criticism continued in the 70s, the UN, declared, the, the UN Security Council declared that this, the continued presence of South African authorities in Namibia after its mandate had been terminated was illegal. And any of the acts that they were doing there was null and void. But that was not sufficient. As you well know that a mere resolution in the Security Council is not all it takes to break down these walls. So in 1971, the Security Council um, referred this particular case to the court, the World Court, asking for an opinion as, as to what were the consequences of the continued stay of the South African authorities in Southwest Africa. Now, of course, it was time, two decades down the road, for the court to redeem its image. And in an advisory opinion to the council, and recalling the importance of development and of the principle of self-determination of people, um, the court held that, all, uh, that the, 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 the continued presence of South Africa in Namibia after its mandate was withdrawn was illegal. This was an indictment for the regime at the time. 
The court declared also that all United Nations member states were under an obligation to refrain from <coughs> any act or acts that might recognize the support for South Africa's presence in Southwest Africa. Indeed, late in the 1970s, the Security Council passed another resolution that laid down a plan for Namibia's transition to independence. The walls of Jericho finally came tumbling down on the 21st of March 1990, when Namibia became independent. But this was as a result of diplomatic, of political, and of judicial um, endeavors from all angles. I must proudly add a personal note to this particular case, which is that in my former life as a Commonwealth legislative consultant, while working on secondment to the newly independent state of Namibia, where I spent six years from 1990 to 1996, I had the privilege of participating in the repeal of the apartheid laws in Namibia in the wake of her independence and in the drafting of virtually new legislation. I will never forget this one law called the law of indecency, where it was considered a criminal offense for a black man to date or marry a, a white woman. But the reverse was not true. It was never considered an offense for a white man to have a black woman for a girlfriend or wife. And I could never understand the logic of this difference. The other irony I could never understand in a country where there was such a wall of apartheid dividing the races was the irony that the greatest number of biracial people in the world is found in South Africa and Southwest Africa. Obviously, someone kept on scaling the apartheid wall over and over again. Anyway, another case that I remember was of a family friend that, that we had. These two people uh, were biracial or colored in the words, they were considered colored in Namibia. And as you know, biologically, um, two colored people can have children that are either completely white or completely black. God sometimes does play these jokes on, on us. And so it happened that this couple, this couple's second son was black. And under the apartheid regime, the races lived in separate parts of the country. And so the government uh, had confiscated this boy and transferred him to a black area where he had no relatives, of course. And these are our friends, the, the husband and wife, had a protracted legal battle in trying to retrieve their son through no fault of their own. This is the absurdity of some of the walls that states build. Uh, of course, their salvation came when um, the country became independent, the laws were changed, and they were able to reunite with their son. In a very small way, I helped to finally pull down the apartheid wall through my work um, with the Commonwealth Secretariat. The second case of the wall, of a wall that was torn down or, or is in the process of being torn down, is the case of the security fence in, of Israel in the West Bank. Now I realize this is a very sensitive uh, case because it's still ongoing um, in, in the United Nations, but it's, it's worth looking at because the court has pronounced itself uh, on some of the consequences, legal consequences of that war. Um, this is a barrier in the West Bank known to Israel as a separation or security fence but referred to by the Palestinians as the apartheid or Berlin Wall of the Middle East. This is a physical barrier constructed by Israel in the West Bank along the 1949 Amistice Line, also known as the Green Line. The barrier has been under construction since 2003 and is expected to reach 700 kilometers in length on completion. It is six to eight meters high in, some, in certain places it is made of concrete in some places and wire fencing in others. It is also reinforced by electrified fencing, two meter deep trenches, ground, fence, ground and fence sensors, 
thermal imaging and video cameras, razor wire, sniper towers, and road patrols, all of which are intended to prevent people illegally crossing the barrier from one side to the other. In other words, it's a great improvement to the Berlin Wall. Israel has repeatedly maintained that it built this barrier as a security measure against Palestine, Palestinian militants attempting to slip into Israel from the West Bank in order to harm, harm Israeli citizens. And as proof of the effectiveness of this security barrier, Israel points to a decrease in the number of terrorist attacks on its civilians since 2003, uh, when back then um, 73 suicide bombings were carried out from the West Bank, killing 293 people and injuring almost 2,000 Israelis. After August 2003, uh, such bombings resulted in only 64 deaths and 445 injured. So Israel points to this as a real proof that this security barrier is working. Critics of the barrier, and in particular the Palestinian population living in the West Bank, have complained that the wall is a pretext by Israel to annex Palestinian land under the guise of security concerns, and consequently jeopardizes the negotiations for peace in the Middle East. Critics also object to a construction route that in sometimes places uh, substantial or that, that in some places substantially deviates eastwards from the Green Line and which severely restricts travel of Palestinian workers both in Israel and the West Banks. They also maintain that the wall has adverse effects on health and medical services, as well as the economy of the West Bank. It is no wonder, therefore, that over the past three decades, there have been many political, diplomatic, and judicial attempts to dismantle this wall, albeit without much success. Now, in October of, 20, of 2003, a UN uh, resolution to declare the barrier illegal, where it deviates from the Green Line, and proposing that Israel tears it down, was vetoed by one of the P5 members. However, in 2003, the General Assembly, again taking matters in their own hands, passed another resolution recommending the wall, condemning the wall, and requesting the World Court for an, ad an advisory opinion on the legal consequences arising from the construction of that wall in occupied uh, Palestinian territory. Uh, in that case, uh, I think Israel had objected to the court's jurisdiction over the matter. But interestingly, um, the court rejected this objection, saying that the Israeli-Palestinian question was not only a bilateral matter between two parties, but rather was of concern to the UN as a whole. I think this is important for us to reflect upon um, for states to reflect upon that before you build a wall of any kind, a time may come when in this globalized world, it's not up to you alone to erect this wall. And the consequences may be uh, for the entire um, international community. So you, you may want to exclude the views and opinions of the international community but you certainly will not succeed because we live more and more in a globalized society. So what was the court's opinion on this case? Um, and, and I've laid down a number of, of important pronouncements that the court made. These are pronouncements of the court, not particularly my own, um, but this is what the court said. One, the court said that the the establishment of Israeli settlements um, in occupied Palestinian territory, coupled with the construction of the wall and its associated regime, you know, all the things I named, sniper, fire, patrols, etc., etc. All these were a set of circumstances on the ground that would become 
a de facto annexation of Palestinian territory. That's the first statement the court made. The second was that the war's construction severely impedes the Palestinian people's rights to self-determination and is therefore in breach of Israel's international obligation to respect that right. Thirdly, that the associate, associated confiscation and or demolition of Palestinian properties, creation of enclaves, restriction on movement or access of, of, of persons to food, water, education, health care, and work, were all consequential breaches by Israel of international humanitarian law and human rights instruments. Fourth, the construction of the wall could not be justified by military exigencies, that is security <coughs> concerns, or by the requirements for national security or public order. In this regard, the court reasoned that an occupying power could not claim that the lawful inhabitants of the occupied territory constituted a foreign threat within the meaning of Article 51 of the UN Charter. Five, ultimately, the construction of the wall and its associated re regime were in breach of Israel's international obligations, and the wall should be removed. The court also stated, in its opinion, the Palestinian residents adversely affected should be compensated, and also advised that other states should take action to obtain Israel's compliance with the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949. Interestingly to date, Israel's separation barrier still stands, and the Israeli-Palestinian question is far from resolved. Perhaps it will take a combination of political, judicial, and diplomatic efforts to bring lasting peace to the region and hopefully to render the security barrier redundant. My own view is that as long as insecurity continues to reign in the region, animosity, insecurity, and as long as the peoples of that region continue to emphasize their differences well, rather than that which part. unites them, <clears throat> this wall will not come down in a long time. Those are the two examples that I wish to draw on, on under the heading of wars as peace breakers. I now wish to turn to wars as peacemakers and some of the cases in which the court um, has been involved um, in building walls, if you like. As I suggested earlier, Barriers between people or states may not per se be inimical to peace building. A border or frontier between two states is one example. Disputes re regarding borders have in all parts of the world resulted in armed conflicts, often extended and often dis destructive on both sides. The judicial settlement of such disputes can facilitate peace where, and this is crucial, where the resolution is broadly perceived to be equitable. Of course, where the judgment of the court is perceived as inequitable, you cannot have peace. It, it will not be respected. International law, and in particular, the International Court of Justice, have played a significant role in this regard. There are numerous examples of land and maritime boundary delimitations adjudicated by the court, but I will refer only to a few. The first case um, that I thought I'd refer to is one from the South Americas, uh, the case between El Salvador and Honduras uh, of 1992. Um, this is the frontier dispute that involved land, maritime, and island division between the, the two countries. Of course, Nicaragua also had an interest um, in, in this. Um, the, the, the 1997 judgment in the frontier dispute between El Salvador and Honduras had a significant effect in reducing political tensions in respect of a conflict 
that had first erupted in the so-called Football War of 1969. The background is that both states and Nicaragua came into existence with the breakup of the Spanish Empire in Central America in, in, 19, in 1821. Thereafter, Honduras, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Nicaragua constituted the Federal Republic of Central America with each of the, their territories corresponding to the administrative divisions of the former empire. In 1839, the, the said Federal Republic disintegrated, giving way to its constituent states, which have since remained separate. Now, during the early decades of the 20th century, thousands of Salvadorians migrated from their home country into neighboring Honduras. This was largely due to an oppressive government coupled, coupled with demograf demographic and land tenure problems in El Salvador. Although Honduras is five times larger than El Salvador, in 1969, the population of El Salvador, that's 3.7 million, was 40% 40, 40 higher than that of Honduras, 2.6 million. By 1969, more than 300,000 Salvadorians were in Honduras, making up 20% of the peasant population there. In 1962, two, Honduras carried out new land reforms, giving the central government and munic municipalities much of the land illegally occupied by the Salvadorian immigrants and redistributing it to native Hondurans. As thousands of Salvadorian laborers were expelled from, from Honduras, El Salvador began claiming the land taken from its citizens as its own, uh, giving serious giving rise to serious tensions that escalated into a military conflict and the so-called football war of June 1969. Why was it called the football war? It took only a couple of FIFA World Cup football matches between the two countries to ignite the simmering violence between them. And this culminated in a cessation of diplomatic relations, border closures, and military co um, confrontation. The war was short, but the consequences were severe. Over a quarter of a million people were displaced. Over 3,000 died, mostly civilians, um, and so on and so forth. But in, in 1986, uh, the parties, I think tired of war, by a special agreement, decided to submit their unresolved boundary uh, disputes uh, to the court, the International Court of Justice. And of course, this part in, in, in the agreement already, um, they, they had agreed to some extent as to where that boundary would be uh, following the, the, the colonial um, determination of, of, of the boundaries of the wall between the two countries. However, a lot remained to be resolved, and that's where the, the court um, came in. So in 1992, the court issued its judgment very carefully delimiting um, the territory between the two and taking uh, intricate care uh, regard, regarding, of course, the, the, the history of the whole conflict and awarding at the end most of the disputed territory to Honduras. Now, two years after the judgment, the two states signed a border demarcation treaty to implement the terms of the ICJ decree. I mention these dates here to illustrate that international legal processes, though they can contribute to peace building in a, a significant way, often move very slowly. The second case I wish to refer to is the case between Libya and Chad over a strip of land known as the Awuzu Strip. This was south of Libya and north of Chad. Again, the roots of conflict between these two countries uh, is found in, in, in their colonial past, whereby Chad was a former colony of France and Libya a former colony of Italy. And these two colonial powers had made certain arrangements and agreements trading off this, this strip amongst each other. What followed upon the independence of both nations was a conflict as who, to who really owned this. 
And the conflict came to the fore when it was discovered that the strip actually contained oil reserves, rich oil reserves. And this is something that usually is, is, is a point of conflict. Whenever oil is discovered uh, in an area, the walls suddenly come up um, for, for, for reasons that, that you and I, are, or for reasons that are obvious to you and I. Um, so briefly, I will not go into the history, but, but uh, to cut the long story short, um, the, the court delivered its judgment um, because this, this matter was referred again. I mean, credit be given to the two states. You know that before the court, a case could never be, uh, come before the court unless the two parties agree to, to um, that agree to embrace judicial resolution rather than conflict as the, their chosen uh, means of, of resolving the dispute. So um, in 19... Um, 90, the two parties, Chad and Libya, jointly submitted their dispute regarding sovereignty over the Strip to the International Court of Justice. And the court delivered its judgment four years later, following the terms of the 1955 treaty, and they awarded the territory of the Awuzu Strip to Chad. Interestingly, the court observed that there was nothing in the 1955 treaty, and this is important to note, this 1955 treaty had expired in 1975, but the matter came to court in the 1990s. And so when the treaty which had awarded the strip to, to Chad had expired, naturally Libya under Muammar Gaddafi thought, well, there is no more treaty. This, this uh, uh, strip is, is, belongs to Libya. But the court said that um, there was nothing in the 1995 treaty to indicate that the, the boundary as agreed then would be temporary or provisional. And that on the contrary, the treaty had determined that the boundary between the two states was with finality, notwithstanding that the treaty its itself expired in 1975. So in other words, the, the treaty, the colonial treaty had actually established a wall between the two countries leaving the Awuzu Strip on the side of Chad. And all that the court did was to, to um, reinforce this decision, if you like, into a binding decision. And much as I think Libya wanted the court to bring down this wall, the court did not do so. The court maintained this wall. Now, as an interesting postscript, uh, the ICJ judgment was delivered uh, or delivered in the Awuzu Strip, um, was monitored by the United Nations Awuzu Strip Observation Group. That's a mouthful. It lasted for one month with a staff of 15 and a budget of only $64,000. It has been described as the shortest, smallest, and cheapest peacekeeping mission ever of the UN. So that's a credit, I think, to the two countries. The, the second case I wish to discuss, the third case actually, I wish to discuss on uh, wars that are not negative, is the case between Cameroon and Nigeria. Again, this was a land and maritime uh, boundary case. Um, this was another bloody um, dispute between the two countries, uh, again over the oil-rich uh, peninsula uh, known as the Bakasi Peninsula that was, uh, was discovered to contain a lot of oil and where Nigeria had been mining oil. But the peninsula obviously was uh, or belonged to Cameroon. So the two parties again, instead of going to war, decided to take the matter to the International Court of Justice for resolution. And the court, um, in that case, in, 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 uh, in uh, I think it was in 2002, the court issued its judgment uh, saying that the border demarcation stipulated uh, uh, left the, the Bakasi Peninsula to Cameroon. Now, of course, Nigeria was reluctant 
to accept the court's judgment and the border um, demarcation stipulated in the judgment. So in June 2006, this is four years later, with the help of the UN Office for West Africa, the two states concluded a green tree agreement, which was designed to implement the judgment of the court. Thus, the formal ceding of territory by Nigeria took place in 2008. This is another four years. Um, so altogether, I think, six years. And this was followed by a transitional plan. So even where the court uh, sometimes builds these walls um, as necessary walls to build or draws boundaries, uh, the parties don't always find it easy to accept uh, the, the judgments of the court. And usually it takes further diplomatic and political efforts in order to bring about real peace. The last uh, example I want to give is the example, and I'm closing with this, of the temple between Thailand and Cambodia. This is a case in which I was personally involved in the court. This is the temple of Priya Vihia, a temple which is an ancient sanctuary and shrine situated on the borders of Thailand and Cambodia. It's, it's, a, world, it's a UNESCO a World Heritage Site. <coughs> and in 1962, the court had given a judgment um, declaring that this, ten, ter, this temple was in situation, in, in territory situated in, in uh, Cambodia, a decision that never went or sat down well with Thailand for the next 50 years. So what Thailand did was to try and, and um, draw a definite boundary, uh, somehow chipping away at the territory around the temple as much as possible. And this led to skirmishes and, and sometimes death in the area. And the matter had to be brought to court recently, again, 50 years later, uh, for the court to give an interpretative judgment of what they actually meant in, 2000, in, in 1962, uh, and on to, to clarify on, the, on that judgment. Um, now, the court declined to draw a boundary because they felt that that, that, is, that was not what the court had been asked to do 50 years before. And uh, under the statute, we, we could not do more than merely interpret what our predecessors had done. But what was interesting is that the, the, the court said that the, the, it, the, what was more important is that this was a, a, a world heritage site that was important, had cultural and religious importance not just to the two parties, but to the whole world. And, they then, and the court then enjoined both countries to cooperate between themselves with the help of the international community in protecting the site as a World Heritage Site. And hopefully, at least from what we've heard, that peace is now reigning in, in the region. In concluding, I'd like to reiterate that walls or barriers, whether they be physical or invisible, are relatively easy to build but very difficult to break down. While in some instances they've been used to promote discord, injustice, and bitter conflict between people or states, at other times, barriers have proven beneficial in peacefully separating one state from another. Whatever their rationale, walls or barriers have consequences in international law for states, which consequences may involve the human rights and civil and political rights of the people concerned and states can no longer afford to ignore those consequences. In peace building, international law works alongside other forces, such as diplomacy, such as negotiation. And in an increasingly globalized world, states can no longer afford to ignore the consequences of their actions. The challenge for states and policymakers is to know when to build walls and when to tear them down. Walls or barriers should never be erected simply to prop up a political regime or system while disregarding the well-being of the inhabitants concerned. 
even in areas prone to insecurity, conflict, or war, where a case for some kind of barrier may be justified, there is need for a careful balance between the need for security of the inhabitants on the one hand and the protection of their human, political, and civil rights on the other. My sincere hope, wish, and prayer is for wisdom for mankind to know when to build a wall and where to tear, when to tear down one. I thank you for your kind attention.